We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Erica Sherman, and I'm a member of the Education Committee. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to the HRRI Research Updates. The Healthcare Regulatory Research Institute is a nonprofit organization established in 2017 by the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy. This session will address HRRI's mission and vision and review some of its current research initiatives. Researchers in the areas of reentry to practice, healthy practice, and healthy practice will share their findings, and the presenters will discuss how the strategic plan will guide future research efforts. The speakers for this session are Ellen Donald, Catherine Dower, and Alyssa Gibbons. Ellen Donald is the director of the FSBPT Board of Directors and also a member of the Florida Board of Physical Therapy and program director for the Golisano? Oh, Golisano, yes, yeah. right. <laughs> Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Initiative and a faculty member at Florida Gulf Coast University. Thank you. Catherine Dower is a consultant with 30 years of experience in research and policy with a focus on health profession regulation and licensing. And Alyssa Gibbons is an assistant professor at Colorado State University and has collaborated with FSBPT's Continuing Competence Committee on projects related to the Healthy Practice Framework. You can find their bios in the event app. Um, they have valuable information to share, and we encourage your participation. If you have a question during the Q&A portion, please raise your hand, and you'll get a microphone from a member of the Education Committee. Um, and please abide by the ground rules in the program notebook so that more attendees have an opportunity to ask questions. At the end, don't forget your QR code to complete your evaluation, as we appreciate your feedback. Now I turn the presentation over to our speakers. Okay, I was going to try to be tough, but I don't have it in me. It is just freezing, and I'm a Florida, I'm a Florida girl now, so um, I'm keeping the sweater on. So welcome. I'm you know nice of you in this late afternoon on this beautiful day to be here to hear about research. As I did in my update, HRI obviously has gotten started since about 2017 and now has been funded. And the four um, studies that we're going to talk about this afternoon are just four of many studies. Uh, HRI has really gotten pretty busy. And as our uh, introduction said, the projects are really vetted based on the strategic plan that was developed. So it's not random. It's trying to be very focused, trying to be very responsible with the funding. And so all these projects fit up in beautifully, and the presentations will show that. These were the four, the, yeah, four, the five, five themes that were established as part of the strategic planning process. Uh, new technology, care, and delivery, we've heard a lot about that behavioral and disciplinary measures, entry level and ongoing competence, workforce issues, and well, uh, practitioner well-being. And you'll see in our presentations, they'll be coded based on which theme that, these, uh, that the research supports. I was not part of this study, but I'm here to report on this study. HRI contracted with an organization called Element, and uh, you might be interested in to see what the public knows about you. So this study was related to the public's understanding of regulation. And if you look at the goal that's related to this, we can't educate the public if we don't know what the public knows about us. So this was a baseline study to do just that. The methodology was an online survey. There was 32 questions. Most of them closed, uh, closed ended questions, but some of them open-ended. All the qualifications for participating was uh, being an adult 18 years or older and have seen a health practitioner or has been a caregiver for someone who saw a health care practitioner in the last two years. So first, when they uh, tried to get survey respondents, we uh, got 750 respondents, but a very small percentage, 6.7%. Uh, had only had some sort of issue when it comes to that health care that was a reportable issue. So a booster sample was collected, and in that, 100% uh, of those folks, the 250 respondents, had had a reportable issue to try to bring that in up to 300, which is a little bit more statistically significant number to work with. Just to give you a feel for the health care they, that they received, either as an individual or as a caregiver, you can see that it was across disciplines, majority obviously with physician, dentist, pharmacist, and nurse, but uh, physical therapists represented almost 20%, both in the, if directly as a patient or as a caregiver. So, Four in 10 said they're familiar. Now, we don't really know what familiar is, but they know that they're familiar with what you guys do, or what we all do, um, with 
4 and 10 meaning very familiar or somewhat familiar with what regulatory boards do in all these disciplines. Just we wanted to get into a little bit about what was the reportable issue and you can see a great majority 60 in the 60 percent range was poor care incompetence was the major issue. But then if you look at the next five categories they relate to bias, discrimination, or inappropriate comments about the person's disability or condition, um, their age, their ethnicity or race, their gender or sexual orientation, or their religion or spirituality. So there was a lot about bias and discrimination in, in the nature of the comments that were made as part of these, um, these reportable issues. 15% uh, had a sexual violation nature to them. So you can kind of see what, the, what happened when there was these reportable issues, what action these folks took. So this was that N of 300, those people that had a reportable issue and what they did with it. 83% decided just to talk to a family member, friend, something like that. 67%, um, they stopped using the provider, which is good, but you might often wonder why not more. 35, excuse me, my eyes, 55% looked at um, reporting it to someone, some organization, might be the employer, might be, it might be the state board, but majority to someone who they thought would do something about it. And the last group, as we're in this day and age, almost 30% posted something on social media as their avenue of reporting what had happened. So this slide's a little, little, got a lot going on. Um, you can see that the vast majority contacted the person's organization or their place of employment. But you can see down in the red box that about, you know, a little less than 30% reported it to the state board for the profession which the issue was. Um, and that's where the people that actually um, did report overall uh, as low as 14% who had an issue. So when asked about why they didn't contact the employer, they just figured it wasn't going to do anything. And you'll see later on that that's kind of a common theme. So that was a vast majority felt like reporting it wasn't going to do anything. There was, there's no point in reporting to their, at least to the person's place of employment. They didn't know how to, re how to report to the place of employment. They wanted to remain anonymous. Uh, they were, they were, the fear of retaliation came up, and you'll see it in a later slide, the fear of retaliation being another issue by, to either the person or the family member. And then um, some believe that the issue wasn't as important enough to report to the employer. So you can look at this slide a couple different ways. It's just under half believe that by reporting, the behavior would change, the provider's behavior would change. But of course, that means a little over half means that they believe that nothing would happen in the person, when it comes to the person's behavior themselves. So now we're going to get into the reason people didn't contact the state licensing board, which is probably what we're most interested in. So as you can see in red, they didn't report it to the state licensing board because they didn't think anything was going to, you know, that no impactful um, action would be taken. Um, I think that's a kind of, this was almost 300 people that, that believe this. So you can see that 62%, it wasn't going to change anything, so why do it? Why, why report to the state board? Uh, you can see that's followed up with that they didn't know it was an option, that they didn't feel... Um, they could stay anonymous, and in some of our states, they can't stay anonymous when you report a complaint, as you all know. The, uh, the other issue of retaliation came up again, even with the state board, that the provider that was being reported may retaliate on them or their family member. Um, as you can see, they don't know what we are. So still, I mean, it has an impact early on with do they know who we are, but now when, even when they're reporting, they still obviously don't know who we are. And then the whole process as they know who we are, but they didn't know um, what service the board, so what we do. So they know, okay, there's these licensing boards, but we, they don't know that complaints 
is something that we do. So these are for those that contacted the State Licensing Board. This might just give you an idea of how they t tend to contact. It might be consistent with how they contact for any kind of um, issue. But obviously the phone is still popular, um, sending an email, even still using snail mail. But I think that this slide tells me you know, how, how much customer service, how much access, how much uh, welcoming do we need to make sure we focus on when it comes to the mode in which people are gonna contact the board, especially when they've had an issue. So did pretty well, actually. 60% were, was pretty, found that the process of submitting a complaint when it was about themselves was pretty easy and about half were satisfied. So that's, that's actually not bad. Um, the, the question is, is that you can see at the, the last pie, there was actually a pretty high percentage believe that something was gonna come of it, that there would be actually a change in the person's behavior by reporting it to the state licensing board, where earlier the slide, when it comes to the employer, it was more about 50%. So there was a little bit more confidence that actually reporting to the state board would result in behavior change on the part of the practitioner. This slide really, this is the last one. This really talks about um, feedback on the process of submitting the complaint based on them, you know, for themselves. Feeling like improved follow-up, maybe more timely follow-up, finding out what the result was of their complaint. The uh, second, the green square I think is interesting is that direct contact, wanting more of that human touch when it comes to after they've submitted something, hearing back from someone from the board in a more personal way. Some were not satisfied with the outcome, which sometimes we don't have a lot of control over. Some, some, some had some comments about the uh, submission process itself, and then there was several miscellaneous comments. And this is all available on the HRI, HRI website. So this report, as well as the other reports as they, come, as they become available, will be posted on the HRI website and you can look into it more. So at this point, we're gonna take questions at the end. We're gonna let Alyssa speak about the healthy practice self-assessment. Thank you. All right. So the healthy practice self-assessment, um, we talked a little bit about this in a session yesterday. I know that many of you have been hearing about it for quite a while now. Um, falls into the practitioner well-being category. So it's in that orange circle there. Um, this is work that I've been doing in collaboration with my colleague, Gwen Fisher. Um, we work as Fisher Work Life Solutions, so that's the other affiliation that's there. Um, I know quite a few folks are familiar at this point with the healthy practice resource, uh, self-reflection resource um, being developed by the Continuing Competence Committee. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole background of the healthy practice framework, but hopefully this model is starting to look very familiar. Um, the self-reflection resource is designed to focus on two of the four pillars of that healthy practice framework, the ones that are most um, most amenable to self-assessment, most reflective of internal experiences and thoughts and feelings. So that's the personal domain and the support and culture domain. And within that, we've identified 10 modules corresponding to the major topics that fall into each of those domains. Um, so the way the healthy practice self-reflection is meant to work is that we have validated, empirically supported measures that people are answering, they are receiving some feedback about this, and then based on that feedback, we want to motivate them to continue to really actively reflect and then move toward action. Um, if you are curious about how this plays out, we did have a session yesterday. We had a demo of one of these 10 modules. If you missed that and you're curious, if you go to your uh, conference app, um, in the description of that session at the very bottom, there is a link where you can go and, and interact with that demo if you'd like to do that. 
My goal here today is to talk a little bit more about the evidence-based piece. Um, that's something that's been very important to the committee from the beginning. This is an organization that believes very strongly in evidence-based practice. And so we wanted to make sure that everything that we were putting into this resource really did have that empirical support. So we conducted a pilot test. This is what we've been working on for more or less the past year. The goals of this pilot test were to ensure that every measure we included and every item within those measures was of, of reasonable quality, met good evidence-based standards, and along the way, a big practical goal was to do that as efficiently as we possibly could. There's a lot of content in those two pillars, a lot of things that we want to ask people about, a lot of things that we want people to be reflecting on and discussing. We wanted to make sure that we did that in a way that was respectful of everyone's time. We wanted to get the most benefit that we could from a reasonable number of measures and a reasonable number of items. So we conducted the study across two phases. Um, some of you, I think, were here last year when we talked about launching this pilot. Some of you participated in that first wave of the pilot, where we had 107 people who were wonderful and completed all 10 of our modules. All of those items uh, we began, I believe, with 441 items. Uh, people did not have to do that all in one sitting, but even so, that was a lot of work, a lot of effort. Um, and we found that it was hard to get lots and lots of people to give us that kind of effort. Um, I know you all are familiar with the challenges of really good psychometric testing. Um, 107 people did not give us quite the evidence base that we wanted for that. So starting um, in the early spring, we moved to a more modular approach where we invited people, if you don't wanna take all 10 of these, that's fine. Could you give us some data about one? Um, and that was a much more effective approach. We had over 600 people complete at least one. Um, some people completed two, some people got excited and did several more, um, but we had a, a nice substantial body of participants at that point. Um, those folks were recruited through a number of strategies. Um, they were promoted at some different events that happened. Some of the boards sent out messages to their members when they had the ability to do that. We had we threw every recruitment strategy we had um, at the problem and we were happy to get a very nice quantity of data. Once we had that data, we went through measure by measure and we evaluated the quality of both the measure as a whole and the individual item. So some of the technical details here, when we looked at the value of each measure, we wanted to know first and foremost that all of the items in that measure were addressing the same thing. Um, in psychometric terms, we talk about fitting a single factor model, meaning that all of our items are related in the way that we would expect if they're really truly all measuring the same thing. Because if you have items that are not all measuring the same thing, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to put those together and put a name on that. We wanted to make sure that if we're giving people a name and saying, hey, this is where you fall in this domain, that it did make sense to, to aggregate those items, put them together. Another property that we were looking for was good quality internal consistency reliability. Um, reliability is a word you hear all the time in the context of psychometrics. My favorite definition for reliability is the opposite of error. The more error we have, the less reliable our measure is. The more reliability we have, the less scores on that measure are influenced by error. Um, no measure is perfect, but we'd like to have relatively more reliability than error. And we have some statistical criteria that we use to set decision rules. Our measures needed to meet these standards. Within those standards, we were looking for items that were really giving us good information. Um, so within those single factor models, every item has a statistic called a factor loading that tells us about how much that item is telling us about the person responding. We'd like items that are giving us lots of good information, items that are not giving us a whole lot of information we can do without, um, particularly if we're focused on efficiency. 
We also looked at um, redundancy, not just in terms of our judgments of redundancy when we looked at the items, but empirical redundancy. Items that were so highly correlated as to be essentially telling us the same thing, even if the words were different. And when all else failed, we looked at criteria about clarity, um, simple, plain language that would be easily understandable, even to folks who maybe didn't grow up speaking English as a first language. So trying to avoid idioms, very colorful turns of phrase that might not appeal to everybody. So just to show you an example of how this worked, this is one of our 68 measures. This is the satisfaction with life scale. Um, you can see the citation there. This is a measure that's been used in the research literature for many years. Um, there's lots and lots of data supporting this as a good quality measure of somebody's very big high level evaluation of their satisfaction with their life. It's meant to be a broad measure. Um, it's not meant to be fine grained and diagnostic. We have lots of other measures for that but it is a good indicator of how somebody feels like they're doing in the big picture. So in this scale, we have five items. Each of these items has a mean around the midpoint of the scale, which is very consistent with what we see in the rest of the literature on this particular measure. People are using all five points on the response scale. So we had people who were strongly agreeing with some of these items. We had people who were strongly disagreeing with all of these items as well. And that's important because that tells us that people are answering thoughtfully. Um, there is variability. There's something to be seen in these items. Uh, none of our items were outside the bounds of what we'd expect for a normally distributed um, variable. Nothing is skewed to the point that we would be concerned about it. And when we get to those far, your right, my left, <laughs> those far columns over there, um, those are the more detailed analyses within the factor model. Our factor loadings are all very good. They're all positive. You can see some of those numbers are a little bit higher than others. And down here on the bottom, we see our overall scale also has that variability. Our Internal consistency measure, Kronbox alpha, is acceptable here. Our CFI is very good. These items do all fit a single factor model, and they work pretty well together. However, now we come to that question of efficiency. Do we really need all five of these items? If you look at these five items, you can see some redundancy, right? You can say, do I really need to answer all five of those to tell you how satisfied I am with my life as a whole? Maybe not. So we looked within each of these scales to look a little bit further. Sorry, I meant to circle that earlier. Our statistics overall look good. Can we make it shorter and not lose any content? These two items in the middle, Overall, I'm satisfied with my personal and family life. That one's not giving us quite as much information as the rest. If I could live my life again, I would change almost nothing. That one is also not quite fitting in as well with the rest of the items as the others. Um, that item actually, it turns out in lots of studies, is consistently the one that's a little bit odd um, out of this set. So we evaluated a little bit further what happens if we take those items, excuse me, out of the measure. And it turns out we can capture, we don't lose anything in terms of reliability, we don't lose anything in terms of model fit. Without those items, we're really doing just fine. Um, so we walked through, we repeated this process for all 64 scales in that pilot test. Um, we then sat down, we had a, a lengthy working session with the members of the Continuing Competence Committee um, who served as our subject matter experts. We walked through these results with them and made decisions about what we were and weren't going to prioritize. So there were some domains where the committee strongly agreed we want to have just a few of these measures that are longer, that are deeper, that ask more questions, that are diagnostic. And the domains where we thought that was important to prioritize were domains related to health and mental health, where the feedback that we might be giving to a user of this system might be, you really need to consult a primary care provider. You really should go and, and have yourself evaluated in more depth. 
This is something you should take seriously. Um, our measure is not diagnostic. We're not a substitute in any way for having that evaluation from a qualified healthcare provider. But if we want to nudge people in that direction, we want to make sure we have good detailed data. We want to make sure that we're not doing that lightly. Another area that the committee thought was very important to ask about in detail uh, was topics related to ethics and the ethical environment of a person's workplace. Are you supported in behaving ethically? Um, are you encouraged to talk about mistakes and be open about them versus hiding those? So those were areas that we said we really want to have good, deep coverage on those topics. Other topics where we said we would we, these are definitely important to include, we want to reference these, we want to be able to give people information about these, but we would prefer to have measures that cover more topics and are themselves shorter were things about specific aspects of a person's well-being. So our measure of job satisfaction is just three items because we've got lots of other measures about particular things about your job that you might be interested, uh, might be satisfied or dissatisfied with. Um, features of the work environment, we wanted to be able to cover and address lots of those, so those are shorter measures. Where we did have some long measures that were high quality, performing well, um, but on the lengthy side, we made choices to break those down into smaller, more focused subtopics because it's a little bit more useful to give people feedback on those specifics and those details. Um, and finally, we did look at correlations across measures over the whole, um, whole resource, and we removed things that were too highly correlated. We didn't want to ask people essentially the same thing in multiple different places. So our current working final version is still 10 modules. We have 68 of those scales. We've reduced from 441 items to 335. And there was much rejoicing when we got to that point. Um, if that's still sounding like a lot of items, what I think is, is maybe a little bit more important, I'll skip ahead to the, the big picture here. Um, all of these scales that we have are showing good psychometric properties. They are meeting our standards. The academic in me has to give one disclaimer. We have one measure that wasn't quite there, but it's very consistent with the literature, and it's a very well-established measure. So we're, we're hanging on to that one. Everything else is looking really good. Each of our 10 modules now ranges somewhere between 14 and 64 items. The resource is meant to be modular. We're not asking people to sit down and go through all 10 of those modules at once. That defeats the purpose of trying to reflect on each of them. So any one module right now is coming in at an average of right around 39 items. They're taking people somewhere between five and 10 minutes, maybe 12 to 15 if you go very slowly and very thoughtfully. Um, I think if you ask some of the folks who did the demo um, yesterday, most people were done with those 20-odd items in about five minutes. So we feel like we've made each module now a very reasonable, very comfortable length, and we are eager to move on to those next steps of building feedback and designing platforms and logistical details, making this available. Um, and as Ellen said, all of these are available for you on the HRRI website. The QR code here will take you directly to our full tech report if you'd like to see more of the details of the other scales. Hello, everybody. It's so good to be here Saturday afternoon talking with a bunch of research geeks. I say that in a loving way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a couple of projects that I've been working on. Some of you heard me speak about one of them yesterday because I did talk about the sexual misconduct communications project I'm working on. But let me just say, these are both under the HRRI um, umbrella. I want to applaud the that this whole effort because it is interdisciplinary, which I love. I'm not a clinician, as many of you know. I'm a, a lawyer by training and licensure, I'm a researcher, a policy geek. and um, but I think interdisciplinary efforts in this space is much needed because a lot of the professions are doing the same thing slightly differently and it really helps from the public perspective to do it jointly and together and collaboratively. So that's awesome. And it's also terrific to be 
doing some research so we have some evidence on which to base uh, policy and decisions. So we'll be talking about uh, that one project that, again, I, I know some of you heard a little bit yesterday, communicating PT and PTA sexual misconduct, opportunities for the regulatory boards. Um, and then I'm also going to be talking about this project around re-entering practice. Uh, so I haven't talked about this one yet this weekend, um, but we're going to be talking about um, I'm kind of the second phase of that project. There was some research done early on, and now I'm helping translate that into a published article. Um, and I want to cross off both of these, I believe, could be applicable to other professions. They doesn't have to be PT. So be thinking about that, too, because for two reasons. One is that some of the research that we're doing on both of these projects builds on what other people have done in other professions. It's no secret. We learn from medicine. We learn from nursing. We learn from other professions. Um, and much of the work that we're doing on both of these can be used for other professions that aren't nearly as far along as PTs are. So um, I really think that that's a, an important theme to keep in mind. Okay, so let's first talk about communicating sexual misconduct. This is going to come up under the behavioral and disciplinary measures circle, I believe. I got a green bar. Um, so this was um, all about, uh, you, we heard the panel yesterday, and we, we talked a little bit about different aspects of it. There were several people on the panel. But this is about how boards are communicating to the public and to their licensees about sexual misconduct, whether it's what the rules are, so how to prevent it, um, if there's any policies there to, to share, uh, what to do if something goes wrong, what the board's going to do if something goes wrong, what public members can do, um, what PTs and PTAs can do. So that's what this project is all about. A um, little bit of background. So as many of you know, and I'm probably we're participating in, the FSBPT has a sexual misconduct and boundary committee. I believe prior to that it was a task force or a work group, um, and sort of has evolved over the years. And in recent years, they put together a number of research efforts and then published those findings. They looked at the websites themselves about how many clicks it takes to get to a complaint form, um, looked at terms for like how, how long a term of the provider-patient uh, therapeutic relationship lasted, there weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of good definitions out there. Um, whether confidentiality was around, et cetera. For so there were all these components were published um, on the uh, website, um, and they still wanted to do more. So that was a little bit of the background. Parallel, the Federation of State Medical Boards uh, put together a task force. I actually think it was, I think the 2012 was an early date, and then they had a task force, they had a report, and then the Federation of State Medical Boards actually adopted it as policy in 2020. This is a comprehensive policy. It's a really well-written and well-thought-out document. It covers a lot of the concepts and the topics in this area. So I, I read that, and I know other people on the, the committee read that. Um, really helpful for designing this work that we've been doing. So we're building on that. And then just last year, um, Carol Cronin and Lisa McGifford in their affiliated roles at the Informed Patient Institute and the Patient Safety Action Network, so you get this public perspective theme here, they published a report looking at the medical boards and kind of seeing, well, how are the medical boards doing in terms of this um, policy that the Federation of State Medical Boards had adopted, specifically targeting communicating through the, the websites. So we talked with them when we were putting together this project and really learned from their experience, and it helped inform designing this project itself in terms of what the methodology was. Um, so uh, again, I looked at some, I did some lit reviews. I tried to figure out prevalence, which wasn't out there except for those numbers from the insurance company. I still think it's really important and interesting. And then the work that um, Kay and others have done in specific states, uh, we're learning prevalence. And I think more work to be, can be done in that. So that's kind of a next year, next to, if I can speak to the folks who are taking notes about what we're doing next. Um, but we need to figure out more about prevalence. But we know from the insurance company that it's a problem. So if they think it's a problem, it's probably a problem because um, they're spending a lot of time and, and effort on it. And then I spent a lot of time looking at the websites. Um, and I had this ginormous spreadsheet. And I was basically looking at all 53 jurisdictions, uh, looking for complaint forms and processes, looking for statutes, rules, looking for policies, of which there were none, as a reminder. There were statutes and rules, but there were no board-level policies about sexual misconduct that could be used by patients, the public, um, or PTs or PTAs, for that matter. There was nothing like 
uh, layperson, non-legally stuff. Um, I looked for ser search features and functionality. Search features were there. Functionality, not so good, just as a reminder. And because it was um, surprising, shocking, sobering, I could put in some search terms like sexual misconduct, and a quarter of the sites had no results for that. No results. And then sometimes I get inappropriate results, as some of you heard about yesterday. We, we got you know, inappropriate ads, adver paid advertisements for sexual relationships um, that I do think is a secondary trauma for somebody who might have experienced uh, sexual misconduct in a PT office. Um, look for language. That was a big deal with the, the uh, group that looked at the medical boards. They were very concerned with the over usage of euphemistic language and non-clear language. So we were looking for that as well with the within the PT sites. Um, then we conducted this experiment, and I was gonna just share with you that we this one evolved in the middle of the project because I was trying to find, we we're trying to figure out ways to identify whether the sites had a tab or a button where you could find out disciplined practitioners. And when I was going through it, I was getting confused because I found it really hard to find out, like, find those tabs or find those little links. And so we actually designed the experiment differently from how I first imagined it, where I actually got the names, um, first and last names, and, uh, and states from the, the Federation of people who had been known to have been disciplined. So we're kind of working at it backwards. And then went into all of the sites to try to see if having the, their names, I could actually confirm that those people had been disciplined and whether it was for sexual misconduct. Um, I also did a little bit of an overview of a lit review from other professions and fields, including medicine and behavioral health, which are two fields that have done quite a bit of work in this area in the health professions. But I also looked at ministry, so faith-based uh, organizations, film industry, and education, where there's a lot of work that's been done for information and recommendations. And then based on all that, I did develop recommendations and templates, working with the committee and working with the, uh, the staff here. Um, so some implications, um, and I think some big takeaways are that I did produce, I included a, a self-audit that the state regulatory board's jurisdictions can use to audit their own websites. It should be fairly straightforward. We're gonna try to turn that into a more um, electronic-based, web-based uh, product that folks can use over the coming months. Um, come up with a, a state board policy that says we don't have any tolerance for, for sexual misconduct, and these are our um, statutes and rules and regs that affect this, uh, but also here's what we will do as a board if you file a complaint as a as a patient. Here's what we're going to do, um, and and let the patients and the consumers know what their role will be in that process, and then get back to them. So, um, kind of mirroring some of the results that you found in your um, study about public perceptions of the regulatory boards, a lot of people. When they go, when when I went to look for information, I couldn't tell whether I was going to be notified. If I filed the complaint, there was no information there. I was like, once I filed the complaint or pushed that button, it's kind of into a complete black box. So um, that policy might help going forward. Um, I do think that these have these implications can be used. There's a number of other policy implications actually, and it's included in the 50-page report that I'm not going to go into all the detail today. Um, but those are kind of the, the high-level ones, and I think that they could also um, there's some policies that could be develop, developed for PTs and PTAs as well, not just for the public. I think a lot of PTs don't know what they're expected and what the consequences for their misconduct might be. Um, I think these have implications for other professions, as I said. There are a number of other professions that are at even earlier stages in figuring out what to do, how to communicate, how to work with their, um, with their licensees as well as with the public. I think a couple of things around um, future research uh, that I would consider is looking at prevalence rates. Um, and then there's another one is comparing and contrasting the statutes and the regulations. As I was going through it, again, with this big spreadsheet, there's so much um, lack of consistency. I mean, it's it's kind of, it's notable. And I think that similar to the, it's surprising with the Model Practice Act that there is so much variation, but it might be worth looking at it and seeing how much variation there is, how much you're willing to tolerate, um, and, and whether that has any impact also on policies and other things. Okay, let me shift now to, oh, and there's your little link for getting that full report, which is now posted on the HRRI website. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Reentry to practice. This one gets a red bar. So this is about um, entry level. This is more about ongoing competencies. So this came about uh, with a technical report that was commissioned by um, the Federation of Professors. Ham 
excuse me, Professor Hambrick at Michigan State University, although he was working independently from the university. He's a cognitive psychologist um, specialized in expertise. And together with a task force that was convened here at the, with the Federation, um, they looked at a number of critical work activities to try to identify how soon people would lose competence in critical work activities in the PT and PTA profession, and how soon those people would be expected to regain minimal competence after they've been out of practice for a while. So this is about re-entering practice after a break in practice. This came about, I understand, the Federation was receiving a few inquiries from some of their boards saying, hey, we're getting some questions about people coming back to the profession after a break in practice, after not being uh, clinically active. Uh, do we have any like guidance on that? Um, and then we also had COVID, which affected this in two ways. One is that uh, in some states, people, some states were calling back people out of retirement or out of you know, clinical non-practice for a while in some of the professions to try to help uh, with the workforce issues. And then some people, because they got sick themselves or were taking care of family members or whatever, also took some leaves of absence and then were trying to get back into the profession. So that's just a constellation of factors that affected that. The task force worked with Professor Hambrick, uh, keep doing that, sorry, it's Zach Hambrick and it's Professor Hambrick, um, that uh, they, he worked with the six subject matter experts uh, on this federation task force and they classified 146 critical work activities in PT and uh, they had 90 critical work activities in PTA. They classified each one of those as either crystallized or fluid. This is all psychological education speak, which I don't know, but I'm just gonna repeat out what I, what I did learn when I was doing this project. Um, they, they classified them as crystallized or fluid. Vast majority are crystallized. All that means for you is that this is the critical work activities in this profession are largely based on things that you learn through prior education. So you, you learn your knowledge and your skills through prior education as opposed to novel experiences where you're expected to come up with some novel solution on the spot. So that's actually good, because that's how PTs are trained, how, and PTAs are trained, and how they're tested, et cetera. And then they further classified everything as either cognitive, sensory perceptive, perceptive, or motor, motoric, physical. So it's either a mental cognitive thing, or it's a sensory thing that you're feeling, or it's actually you know, moving and physical. Um, so everything was classified. Again, a huge spreadsheet, as I understand, a giant, ginormous spreadsheet. Um, and, uh, and then they classified things as uh, they rated them. So the, the PT average loss, I'm going through this so quickly, but this is the, the key takeaway. PT average loss of all those critical work activities was 12 to 24 months. And uh, the average recovery time was two to three months. In other words, on average, between one and two years of disuse, you've lost half of your critical work activity competence, according to these, to these subject matter experts, who are your peers, but it is, it is a limited group, I admit that. Um, and not surprisingly, the faster the rate of loss, the longer the recovery time. So the things that you lose the quickest take the longest to recover. So I don't think this is counterintuitive, but it is the first time it's been documented for this profession for sure, and it's not too, I don't find it too much in the other professions as well, which again, I think is gonna be really informative for other professions um, because they don't have a lot. Like for example, the, the medical boards kind of use this guidance of two years, but they don't cite a lot of evidence for that. Um, it, from what I've seen so far. Um, and just as a, a, a little what, illumination, some of those critical work activities that get lost the fastest are things like medication, um, uh, management, treatment, actual treatments, physical treatments, manipulations, versus the things that fall off the slowest and are the quickest to return, those are things like uh, professional attitude, uh, a positive attitude at work, ethics and professional demeanor, things like that. The, according to the subject matter experts, those things don't fall off as quickly and are also easier to, to return to competence. Um, Okay, so I read the technical report about five times because I had to learn all that lingo. And then we started outlining it to turn it into a published article. Um, so we also did the journals that were available to us so we might submit something. We did another lit review, an environmental scan. Uh, we did submit an abstract that was accepted. The abstract was accepted. Um, and now we're finalizing the article and we're crossing our fingers. Hopefully we'll have a, that's the outline of the article for you. Um, 
I want to comment on a couple of limitations. One limitation, as I mentioned, subject matter experts, there were only six of them. A lot of that's okay, but you could probably do more. The other thing is it is subjective. Um, so anything that anything in this space that's done is a little bit subjective. So it's I'm trained to poke holes in evidence in an argument, so I could poke holes in this. I also would bet that you'd only vary by a very small margin. That would be my, my bet on some of this. Um, but I do think it has policy implications specifically for PT, if you're interested, and for other professions as well, around re-entry rules and guidelines. Because now knowing this, it means that the regulators, you can be justified in asking PTs to disclose periods of disuse. You could be justified in doing that now, um, based on this research that's done. Uh, you could also be justified in asking people to demonstrate competence in some way or to be supervised for some period of time if they've been out of practice for a while. So those are pretty big things. I think, interestingly, um, one of the things that sometimes comes out of research like this, you're not expecting it, but now, Recertification, if somebody hasn't been, if they disclose on their recertification that they haven't been practicing for the past year or 18 months, sometimes you've got a two year renewal, right? Um, what do regulators do with that now that you know this knowledge that, boy, they might have lost half of their minimum competence? So it's, it's, a little disturbing to find information sometimes that you weren't expecting, but it's also interesting. I think it will add to the work that's going on, or all the work that's going around in continuing competence in all the professions. I do think this is one of the first times that this has been done, as I said. Many of the professions are struggling with it, but it's, it's really valuable information. Um, I do think, oh, one other hopefully small problem uh, is that we, uh, we're getting some pushback from the journals because it's not IRB approved. I'm just going to mention that because we did this, you know, under the Federation, which is not an academic institution, and the other consultant uh, was doing it separate from his university. So I just want to raise that because I do think HRI research and publications are going to be invaluable to this profession and to all of the sister professions that are that are uh, working on it, but also we have to think about getting the things published. So I just want to mention that because I think that um, it's one of the important things to consider. And I think that's it. Uh, oh, no, one other thing. If you're putting together, you good. You <laughs> one more thing before I go. Um, the, if you're putting together a program for reentry, which medicine has like at least eight programs, I think, for reentry. Um, if you're even considering that, it's worth focusing on these issues that we now know are the first to be lost and the hardest to regain. Don't create a program for the things that aren't getting lost so quickly. So this will really help inform any policy efforts around reentry programs. So that's a, another key takeaway for it. That's all for me. I think we'd have a couple minutes for questions now. Thanks, everybody. Sorry. So are there, are there any questions at all about any of these topic areas? Yes. Uh, coming around. Go ahead. Right there, Anne. Thank you. So, no, no just, just simply, uh, Catherine, what you just discussed, is that available somewhere that we can read it? Yes. The... Um, Hambrick's technical report is available on the Federation's website right now. Um, I don't have the QR code for that, but it's on the Federation site, and it's, um, maybe Rich, you can help me out. I'm not sure where to find it, but it's, it is on the site. So that's the technical report that Professor Hambrick did. Um, the article that we're trying to get published hopefully will be out next year, but it, it's in process, so we haven't been accepted yet fully. Yeah. Hi, Katie from Louisiana. Um, something that comes to mind um, with listening to especially the reentry component of it is um, when we grapple with suspensions yeah. and the timeline for those suspensions, especially when the suspensions are more so a punishment as opposed to, you know, a, I need to get you out of practice immediately for safety reasons, that all boards kind of struggle with that balance. Um, can you kind of comment on? Um, are we doing more harm, potentially, in that situation? It's a really, really good question. And I'm, I'm going to 
say something, but then I'm going to turn it over to the others. The, the one thing I'll say is that we excluded anyone who had been suspended or disciplined from the research. So, like, all of this was based on people who were fully competent when they stopped practice, practicing and had no issue or blemish on their records. And we did that intentionally because we didn't want to have to deal with the suspended issue or the people who had been sp suspended for other reasons. Um, but I think it's a really, really good question. And I, from personally, I think you... I mean, it might be worth doing some research on it because, or maybe have some way to have some probation where somebody's not allowed to see their own patients but are still practicing somehow or shadowing. I mean, that's just me brainstorming, but I will turn it over to Ellen. Well, I'll just comment. That's a, it's a great point. We're trying to, we're saying they're not competent or they're do, they have done something wrong, yet we take them out of practice and then now we see this, this decrement of knowledge, this, this drift, right? Um, and then there's natural life events that happen. You go on maternity leave. You have an elderly parent you're taking care of. You have, you know, some sort of life event. You have a hurricane, you, whatever. And people are, are out of practice for a while. And I think the most kind of riveting part of that is the fact how, how quickly, I mean, how quickly. So I think it's a great start, right? And it sounds like a great future HRI <laughs> um, research just to go into that more. But you're right. Are we doing harm? by taking them out and not having some sort of then catch up or some sort of remediation after that suspension? Great, great question. No answer, but great question. Any other questions? Yes. Th thank you very much for the presentation. I'm, I'm curious, uh, related to the re-entry to practice, um, and, and I'm new to the whole regulation side of things, so I'm, I'm curious, are there are any um, tools that are being used or in development for assessing clinical competence for people who are returning? Say, you, you want to be able to assess what they're doing um, in clinical practice that they're safe and all of that without having them retake the MPTE or, you know, uh, find a school that will supervise and, and, and fill out a, an official form or whatever. Are there any tools that are available to, to help yeah, that's it. That's regulatory it. boards yeah. determine whether they're competent and safe? Not that I'm aware of. I'm going to look at Rich, but I mean, you, you know, certainly start with somewhat the, the healthy practice self-assessment to some degree to just look at are you in a well place, period. And then when it comes to knowledge and skills, so I'm going to look at Rich. <laughs> We do have a yeah, performance evaluation it, tool yes. that wasn't designed for this purpose, but could be modified for this purpose, depending on the on the board. So that you had, uh, say, you were a jurisdiction and you had somebody trained overseas, and you wanted to make sure they had a supervised clinical practice performance evaluation tool. Is a tool Federation has put together that could be used for this this purpose to just ensure that competence was made. The the board would be able to see that and eventually grant full license if everything was completed appropriately. Thanks, I, I, and I saw that that was available for foreign trained. Um, yes. Is that currently available for non-foreign trained? It and are any jurisdictions? For you, it's it? currently available, period, right? You're, as a board, uh, you all have access to that and could request it for anybody at any Has it time. been validated at all? We or? have not validated it this way, right? It was right. validated for the foreign trained. For the foreign side. trained, okay. And then when it comes to our actions, you would think, you know, we do, we do uh, suspension. Should suspension almost always be followed then with a probationary period where you'd have to get them to get a supervised clinical practice, which you're right, getting, getting people to to do scans of them and observe them and periodically report back to the board is hard to sometimes get. But should a, should a suspension always be followed up with some sort of probationary period because of that reason where you're... Thank you very yeah. much. We've used, in the same line, we, like Rich said, we've used the uh, performance value, uh, a Frankenstein version of the performance evaluation tool for re-entry to practice uh, for individuals that have been out for a significant period of time and the board thinks that they need supervision. Uh, but we also have a method, and it's kind of in the same line, but it's not as much of a Frankenstein version of the PET for individuals that are coming back to practice from disciplinary action, like a monitoring that we've developed. And that's something you've developed in your years? Uh, yeah, so... 
uh, the monitoring port, we, we built our own portal for monitors to go in and document, and depending on the case or the type, if it's a documentation issue, the, the portal has all the documentation bit pieces so somebody can go through and just check boxes so the board can see the progress of patient records, uh, overall interactions with uh, uh, patients because they're supposed to, the monitors are supposed to observe that, how their records look, how the conversation with the supervisors went, including PTs who have, you know, clinic supervisors or whatever. But yeah, we built an entire portal from scratch for that. That's nice. <laughs> Kentucky board. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, one more session and you are done. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.